I'm Hemant Mehta, and I'm flying solo today, and you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. You can now listen to all of our episodes and see show notes at FriendlyAtheistPodcast.com. And by the way, we now have merchandise shop on the website, so if you want your podcast swag, and you know you do, go to our website and click on the store tab. Dawn Eden was born into a Jewish family, became an agnostic during her teenage years, and then found God and became a Catholic in her 30s. Not your typical religious journey. Along the way, she was a rock journalist and worked as an editor for the New York Post and Daily News. Since her conversion, she's written the books, uh, several books, including The Thrill of the Chaste and Remembering God's Mercy. In addition to all that, she just earned her doctorate, so congratulations on that. Thank and you. I may very well owe her my entire career, so we'll talk <laughs> about that in a second. So I'm so glad you said that. I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> so, Don, thanks so much for uh, taking your time right before you give a talk to uh, talk to me. Can you do me a favor? Walk me through this religious history, because I think a lot of the atheists listening to this, that's an unusual story for someone to be agnostic, as you describe yourself, and then not only find God, but then specifically Catholicism. Yes. Well, I was born into a Jewish family. On At the time of my grand, grandparents' youth, uh, the faith was stronger. They were more observant. But by the time the faith got down to my parents, it had been watered down. So whereas my grandparents would have been like considered, I guess, um, you know, either like very observant reform or cons- or conservative. And before then, way back, we've got Orthodox Jewry, you know, in, in our ancestry. Uh, um, by the time the faith got down to me, it was very liberal reform. Uh, that was how my parents were. And um, after my uh, bat mitzvah, uh, when I was uh, 13, uh, I uh, fell away from faith. Um, I used to uh, suffer from depression in my teens and 20s um, and uh, early 30s until my uh, conversion to Christianity at 31. And when I suffered from depression, I would be uh, suicidal and I would really try to convince myself that uh, God didn't exist. And I could never quite convince myself of, of that. But I tried then to do what was, you know, for me, you know, it feels funny calling it this, but the next best thing, you know, if one's suicidal, think, well, if God exists, he obviously doesn't care about me. Um, But I could never completely be convinced of that either. Um, And then when I was 31, uh, I had a conversion experience that convinced me that God really existed, that Jesus was his son, and that I could no longer think about harming myself because God had a plan for me. Uh, I don't know if you want me to talk about what prompted that conversion right yeah, now. Yeah, that was my next question. What is it? Because I guess the question I really want to get to is, is what happened to you something that could have only happened to you? Or is it something that if you met an atheist and you were trying to convince that person to believe in God, is this story, whatever prompted your conversion, is that something that would convince someone else? I don't think that rational arguments can uh, convince anyone of the faith, like just by themselves. I do think rational arguments are very important because you know it's important that we be able to show that faith that faith is is um, compatible with reason. That faith is not unreasonable. Um, but I'm definitely not of the school of apologists who believes that if you just sit down with someone who's rational and present to him this super rational argument for belief in God, that that person therefore is forced to believe by the power of reason. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, I, um, I, I began to become open not just to Christian faith, but to faith, period. Um, actually, through... Uh, a book recommendation made to me by a rock musician. I was a rock journalist uh, from my teens through my 20s and early 30s. And uh, I I was in in particular a rock historian. So I wrote what were known as liner notes, the booklets to (laughs) compact discs. Yes, yes, uh, to compact disc reissues. This was back in the 90s when when record labels were trying to get people to repurchase their vinyl collections on CDs, and so they would add these extras, like the booklets with the interview with the artists. So I would interview artists like 
like the Hollies and Harry Nilsson, Del Shannon, Gene Pitney, and also writing for Mojo Magazine I, and other magazines, I would interview artists like Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. And it, and it came to pass that in December of 1997, uh, no, no, December 1995, uh, when I was 27, which now... Um, makes me <laughs> um, <laughs> a little problem with the yeah sound the line problems there, you know yes. it happens <laughs> <laughs> right so I was interviewing a member of a power pop band called the Sugar Plastic a musician named Ben Eschbach and I asked him what he was reading and he mentioned that he was reading this novel by an author I'd never heard of, G.K. Chesterton. Oh, okay. And the novel was The Man Who Was Thursday. Now, you know Chesterton because he's considered this, he is, you know, this great convert to Catholicism uh, from Anglicanism and author of uh, many books about Catholic faith. But The Man Who Was Thursday is a novel, and I picked it up just wanting to read this book that this musician recommended to me, having no idea that Ch Chesterton was this Christian author. And what I found, particularly at the end of it, was something akin to the book of Job, which was uh, theodicy and a question ab about suffering. Why does God suffering. allow evil? A yeah. e evil and, or su suffering, and suffering. Yeah. And the answer that Chesterton poses, and I don't want to spoil the book for sure. anyone, but uh, he suggests through you know th through the art of fiction that the answer to suffering can only be found through by looking at the mystery of the of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ and you know reading that it didn't make me a christian but the way that he used that line from the gospels where Jesus says can you drink of this cup that I drink of and he uses that to really hammer home that any cup of suffering that we've drunk that Jesus has drunk that cup uh, that was powerful it made me want to read more Chesterton and I spent the next four years trying to read all the uh, Chesterton that I could uh, get my hands on and then finally that led me to want to read what had inspired Chesterton, the Psalms uh, and uh, St. Paul's letters. I, I had read the Gospels before, and I'd always liked them, but I had felt like, um, like I couldn't accept Christianity because of the behavior of Christians. Sure. And I thought, you know, Christians, you know, you, you could basically name any criticism that you've heard atheists say about yeah. Christians, and those were all, you know, the things that I had seen in Christians, particularly you know, as a Jewish uh, person and knowing something about the history of, of persecution of, of Jews. You know, uh, now I understand better than I did before that, uh, that the Nazi um, persecution was not a Christian persecution. But, you know, there's no denying that the Nazis had a heritage of anti-Semitism right. upon which they could, you know, build and feed. So one question I have, I, I can kind of understand, I can wrap my head around the mm -hmm. idea of people who are not religious finding some semblance of God and they uh, become religious in mm -hmm. that sense. Okay, mm -hmm. I believe now. I've heard that story many times. I, I at least understand where people are coming from. Mm -hmm. One of the one thing I don't get is the all right. I believe in God. I think God exists. These arguments kind of make sense, but to go from there to say I specifically accept Catholic doctrine that seems like a way bigger leap. That it's not just religion or the idea of God existing that's right. It's this specific view of it, and that's something I have a hard time wrapping my head around. It's a great question. Well, I had a hard time wrapping my head around yeah. that too. And at the time that I became Christian, um, I. Uh, I um, was at my mother's house uh, when I uh, really uh, felt uh, felt moved to ha have the faith, and and um, then uh, I was asking my mother's advice. She was my expert in Christianity because when I was a teenager, long you know before I became Christian, she had entered the Catholic Church, and then actually uh, within a couple of years dropped out of the church and she still believed in Jesus but was sort of doing her own thing identifying more as a messianic Jew which is kind of like Jews for Jesus yeah. a variant of Protestantism 
And so I asked my mother what to do, and she said that I needed to uh, pray the sinner's prayer, which is a prayer you can find in any Gideon's Bible, asking, it's admitting being a sinner and asking Jesus to come into your heart. And I, and I prayed that, and that's, it, it was after praying that that uh, I went to bed that night and I woke up believing that, that God really existed and that Jesus was his son and that I couldn't harm myself anymore. But that didn't mean I was going to become Catholic. In fact, uh, my mother being a fallen away Catholic and being my expert on these things, um, she, she if told she me, fell away from it, then well, yeah. <laughs> why am I jumping to it? Well, yeah, yeah, exa- exactly. Um, and she told me, you don't have to be Catholic to be Christian, which is, is in fact true. Right. And uh, she also told me that Catholics had all these kind of rituals that are just kind of accretions and and not just not necessary. And I thought, well, I don't want to take on anything that's not necessary. I'm already feeling weird about being in a club that would have me for a member. I'd right. always thought of myself as being this outsider. Uh, and so I, I thought that as a Christian, I would be ABC, anything but Catholic. But what happened was that over the next five years, well, first of all, I went church shopping and trying to find the church that felt right. And, you know, it was like Goldilocks and the Three yeah. Bears. No church felt quite right. And I remember once going to a Presbyterian church in New York City, and the time came for their communion. And before their communion, they explained that they had what's known as a gated communion, where only members of their denomination could could receive. And they said, like, in, if you are not part of our denomination and you try to go up, you know, I'm just saying it could be bad for your soul. And I thought, how is that? Because I knew that they didn't believe that it was really Jesus' body and blood. And so how could it be bad for you Mm -hmm. to not receive that? That just made me think just logically, rationally, I could, I could understand the Mm. logic uh, behind Catholics having communion only for people who are Catholic and who are part of, you know, other uh, churches that accept the Eucharist as they do, like the uh, Eastern uh, churches. That made a lot more sense to me than other kinds of gated, gated communions. So the Catholic doctrine kind of made just more sense than some it, of these, I guess, I don't know if this is the right word, but like the wishy-washy sort of Protestant well, versions yes, of that, it. Well, yes, and that's the word that I would use, yeah. although it's not a very ecumenical sure. word. <laughs> um, so it made inter- internal sense, but also I started getting really like taken by the, the uh, Catholic um, doctrine concerning the dignity of every human life, uh, because I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, and in my books... My piece, I give you healing sexual wounds with the help of the saints and remembering God's mercy. I write for people who have suffered trauma and seek healing. And so, you know, I I knew that there had been this abuse crisis in the church and that, you know, didn't make the church, you know, seem, you know, appealing to me. But I also knew that anywhere you have human beings, you have sinners. So I was looking for... So the problem isn't Catholic doctrine per se, it's that you have some messed up people who are working in the church. You have some messed up people, and you also may have some messed up rules that make it easier for abusers to hide, and that those rules can be changed. Uh, But with regard to the doctrine, um, is the doctrine protective of human dignity, human life? And the more I started learning about Catholic doctrine, the more I saw that if everyone followed Catholic doctrine, then there wouldn't be abuse and there wouldn't be this disregard for human life that one that one sees in uh, abortion and in the kind of contraceptive uh, ment- mentality that that is ultimately harmful and degrading to. To, chi- to children. Um, I yeah. should point out, by the way, there is so much I would love to discuss and debate right now, and we have so limited time, so that's why I'm not pursuing all these questions oh, no, that I'm I coming under- up no, with. No, I understand. I'm sure that your yeah. regular listeners know <laughs> that that you, you know, 
just because you're not saying anything doesn't mean that you necessarily agree right. with everything well, I'm saying. Well, let me ask you this, because one of the books you wrote is The Thrill of the Chaste, and mm-hmm. part of that is pushing this idea that abstinence is a good idea if you're single, and it's more complicated if you're married, That's because right. you talk about yes. that too. But this is a, a argument I've heard with the Catholic Church many times, which is that maybe if the Catholic Church didn't have the doctrine that priests had to be celibate and single, we would see less abuse because they kind of need this outlet and these kids are accessible to them. That's an argument I've heard. Does that make any sense? Do do you think that that has, that could be a solution that if the Catholic church decided, you know what, you can get married, you can have a family um, and you can have sex. Maybe we would see less of this. Is that argument that holds any sway? This is one area where I think that sociology can help. Um, I say this because celibacy of of priests is a discipline. It's not doctrine. There's a strong tradition behind it. I'm in favor of it personally, but the Pope could change that at any time and allow for uh, for married priests in the uh, Western Church. It's already allowed in the Eastern uh, Church, Uh, and so and it's already allowed for priests coming at the moment, for priests coming in from Anglicanism. So with regard to sociology, I think it helps to look at the rate of sexual abuse in other fields, be it it, um, non-Catholic churches where there's not a celibate priesthood, uh, be it uh, public schools, anywhere where people have access to children. And is it any different from what you found? No, no. uh, There's nothing in sociology to show that I mean, if you've got the best numbers. Now, there are some figures that in the early years of the crisis were thrown around, and and those figures make it seem like there's an exorbitantly high number of priests who are abusers. But if you look at the hard evidence that, that comes from you know the best data, the, it, it's not showing a higher rate. So I don't think that that the I, that abuse like alone. Uh, the abuse rate is an argument uh, against the celibate priesthood. So to put it another way, in a sense, uh, yes, there is abuse in the Catholic Church. However, it's no different than you would find in the rest of the population. Maybe they just get an outsized amount of the publicity that goes with the abuse. I, I think that's right, but I think it's also important to say, and I say this as someone who's been studying for eight years at, at, at seminaries and who's about to graduate and teach at a seminary, I think it's very important that the abuse crisis lead the church to look at how it forms men for the priesthood, and particularly how it, it, it um, how it handles what's called human formation, which includes celibacy. And I do think that in the past uh, there was an unhealthy atmosphere of repression and secrecy at seminaries that made it much easier for men who were not psychologically mature and who had abusive personalities to hide. And uh, the uh, Catholic Church uh, is now trying hard to uh, reform that culture. It takes time, and the Catholic Church isn't run as top-down as people imagine, but there are positive steps. Let me ask you a few quick questions in the time we have left. Uh, What do you think are the biggest problems right now facing the Catholic Church? I think the biggest problems facing the Catholic Church have to do with bad catechesis. People don't understand their faith. People don't understand what happens in the in the mass. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, we ha- we had um, after the Vatican Council, uh, the Second Vatican Council, a lot of uh, confusion uh, that led to um, Catholic liturgy not being done as it should be done in the books, and it's being done in in some places more like Protestant liturgies. And so, so there's nothing defining the Catholicism. Yeah, there's nothing defining. I shouldn't say or nothing. Or they're not doing a good job of explaining it to the people yes, who are coming yeah, in. Yes, and I'm speaking not of ca- the Catholic Church everywhere, but in some places. So people, w- without knowing what their faith means, they don't have anything to hold on to, and and they don't know how to have that cohesiveness that Pope Francis talks about, that we need to have a cohesiveness between liturgy and life. It shouldn't be like we just go to church, pray, and then get on with the rest of our life. The way that we pray and the way that we understand our prayers should lead us to live a certain way, to do certain kinds of social outreach, social 
justice. Uh, and uh, that's something that I think Pope Francis is trying to do, to get us to do, just as Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul II did before him. And I, and I hope that, and pray that that continues. Uh, you have also been blogging for longer than pretty much everyone who's doing it right now. And I want, I mean, how long has, when did you start blogging? I started blogging in 2002. I, nowadays my blog, The Dawn Patrol, is mostly just news about myself yeah. and my apostolate. But I used to blog about important issues. And so when this atheist wrote to me <laughs> saying that he was, uh, quote unquote, you know, selling his soul, offering yeah, his soul not the words on I e used, eBay. I don't it, think. It, yeah. it wasn't actually the words <laughs> used. That's the words that the news media yeah. used. But he said that he was uh, looking to, you know, to raise funds, I think, for charity, right, yeah, yeah. by offering to go to the house of worship of anyone who would want him yeah. to go. I, um, I looked at this and then I Googled the atheist's name yeah. just to see if there was any evidence that this really was an atheist, that this was for real. And then I put it up with, you know, some comment, but trying to... I, I was in a pretty judgmental mode at that time as a new <laughs> Christian, but I was really trying not to be judgmental. And I think being friends with the raving atheist helped me to be, yeah. not be so Who judgmental. Who used to be a longtime atheist blogger, too, and then became a Christian. Yes, yes. Um, and I have to say, your post about my eBay auction at the time, that's probably the first uh, time it started taking off online. And if there's any coverage that came from that and all the publicity that came from that, I think that started with you because you had such a passionate readership that they saw it, what you wrote and they're like, all right, I'm going to talk about this because all the people talking about it all linked back to you. And yes, that was, yes, that was that's different right. for me. So and that I was have interesting. to say, praise God. I mean, just following what you've, what you've done. I know it sounds funny to, see <laughs> to say praise God for an atheist, but I'm just so thankful uh, because you've opened up dialogue in a way that well, I think you. is really important. But thank Sounds you good. so thank you, much, Don. I and appreciate I hope to it. speak with you again. I hope so, too. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois. The music was composed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at patreon.com slash hemant. That's He-Man T. We appreciate your support. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at friendlyatheistpodcast at gmail.com. I'm Hemant Mehta, and I hope you'll join us next time.